from the US. Diego is the co-founder and CEO of Juna, the open data platform for governments. Please welcome Diego. Hey, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, we have six, seven brave people that at this stage of the event want to learn about open data, so thanks for the time, really. Uh, we've been working with open data for five years now. Uh, first, we started helping consumers, learning how consumers wanted to use data. We are in this big data days. Everybody talks about what can be done with big data. What what insights we can derive when we have a lot of data and we can process that, right? We also know that governments have a lot of very, very valuable data, data that today is being very opened in the UK, also very opened in, in the US. And what we've been doing for the last couple of years, actually, was once we learned how people want to use data, what we did was we put together a platform that helps governments that have all this valuable data to really open that data up. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next 20 minutes. Now, let me go through a quick video, a two-minute video that will describe this a little bit. Hello, I'm Todd Park, U.S. Chief Technology Officer. And I'm Stephen Van Roepel, U.S. Chief Information Officer. Today, we're going to talk to you about the President's executive order on open data. Today, President Obama took a historic step in issuing an executive order to make government data open and accessible by default. Open data holds huge potential for the U.S., not only inside government promoting transparency and efficiency, but also for economic value, fueling entrepreneurs and innovators to create solutions using government data. Starting today, new and modernized government information resources will be made open and machine readable by default while protecting confidentiality, privacy, and national security. So you've heard about the executive order. Now Todd's going to tell you in less than 60 seconds about the value of open data. Government information is a valuable national asset. The administration is committed to unlocking more and more data from the vaults of the government as fuel for innovation that can help improve government and grow the economy and create jobs. Open government data actually fuels many innovations today that we take for granted. For example, the U.S. government's Global Positioning System, or GPS, powers all kinds of amazing products, ranging from navigation systems to precision crop farming uh, to location-based apps on your phone and much more. Open weather data from the National Weather Service actually fuels all kinds of things, from weather newscasts to weather apps to even new kinds of weather insurance, improving all of our lives, growing the economy, and creating jobs. And through the President's executive order, as we make more and more government data available in fields like health and medicine, public safety, education, energy, and much more, you'll see all kinds of new startups, new companies, new innovations that improve all of our lives, help grow the economy, and create jobs. We can't wait to see what American entrepreneurs and innovators will do next with the growing supply of open government data. So, uh, I, know, I don't know if you were able to hear everything that was said there, the, the audio and everything, but basically, President Obama started in 2008 with this initiative of open data. Of course, the UK has been doing a lot about open data. And the idea here is you have all these data as governments. That data was generated because of taxpayers' money, mainly. And then it makes a lot of sense to open up that data back to the, to the citizens, right? And there is a lot of people talking about how this open data can now improve how we do government. And we're going to touch more of that now. But basically, there's an interesting book, if you're very interested about open data, uh, called Citizenville. This book was written by Mayor uh, Gavin Newsom from San Francisco. And basically, here he talks a lot about what are all the benefits of open data. Uh, there are a lot of other things that have been published by research, Forrester Research, Deloitte, that really talk about all that. And of course, if you contact me, I'm happy to share some of that. And very important as well, a lot of top universities are starting to talk about open data and the impact that that can generate. Now, what I was planning to do in the next uh, minutes, as I said, is first touch on why open data, why open data is relevant. Then move a little bit on the practical examples of open data, uh, some of the things that we've been doing with clients in the US and with other people in Latin America. And finally, uh, talk about what's coming, uh, what's coming next in regards to open data. 
And by the way, this is the first important tip. Whenever you want to say a lot of things about something and you have little time and you want to impress, this is an awesome, awesome image. But basically, in this, uh, I, I use this image to think about the web. If you think about the web as a total, probably what, we've, what open data is uh, in this representation of the whole web is only the tip of the iceberg. And the other way in which I can use these nice images, what we've seen up to now in open data, what, what has been done by the UK, what is happening in the US, what is happening in some governments in Latin America or other places of the world, is only the tip of the iceberg of what is going on with open data. And my co-founder and I saw this kind of image or idea about five years ago when we got together and we started thinking about Junar. And what we saw back then was that if you're interested in finding content in the web, text, that's pretty easy because it's pretty simple to go and publish content to the web. If I go and ask you, go and create or go and create an account in some service that will allow you to publish 140 characters uh, type text, probably you know where to go, right? Twitter. If I ask you to go and publish videos, Again, same thing, it's pretty simple to know how to go and publish videos. And for that reason, it is pretty simple to then go and find a lot of content and a lot of videos and a lot of images. Now, if I ask you, where would you go if you have a very interesting data set to create an account and publish that? You there, where would you go? What would you use? Or you there? Okay, so today, probably and before this pitch, I would uh, open an account in Dropbox and I just upload. I would upload it, upload the, the data there, basically in Great. X, uh, CCS, CSV file or something like that. Yeah, something like that. And that's a great answer. Actually, we have another answer there. I don't know. Do you know Hans Rosling? And uh, Hans Rosling, it's a sociologist, and yes. he, and he have a site with uh, big amount of data. I don't know the name of the website now, but I know that exists. And there are beautiful data, amazing data, and there are lots of this uh, type of data. Yeah. So. No, fantastic. Actually, so two great points. There are some organizations or some people that is great at looking for interesting data, and then publishing that data, doing great uh, visualizations of the data and showing a lot of things, telling stories with data. And then if you have some data, probably the best way is either you get a WordPress account or you do a Dropbox thing and then you publish some data. But it's not easy. It's not easy to publish data. And for that reason, whenever you go to try to find data in the web, that's complicated. And by the way, what I mean by data is tabular data, tables, spreadsheets, data sets, right? So this very valuable data that could be used for a lot of things, very difficult to publish, very difficult to find. And that's what we found five years ago, and that's what we've been doing. I actually really appreciate this type of event, because five years ago, we were talking to the walls when we were talking about open data. And today, there's a lot of people that really understand uh, this concept. Now, as we mentioned before, not only the US and the UK started with this, then uh, something got formed called the Open Government Partnership. And this is basically an organization that is pushing for this open data movement all over the world. So now there are more than 60 countries around the world that are committed to open government. And a big piece of that is opening a lot of valuable data. Now, why is this relevant? Well, of course, any government that is doing open data is complying with the transparency and accountability mandate. So that's a very important thing. The second thing, engagement. A lot of governments that are doing open data well are really being able to connect with communities in a very nice way. Third, efficiencies. Governments that are opening data are doing cool stuff, and I'm going to show a little bit about that now. And they are being able to generate a lot of innovation, things that government before would have not been able to do alone. Now they're being able to open up some valuable data. And then people like you, developers, hackers, can come, see that data, and create very innovative things. 
Now, these are all good, and I enjoy them a lot. But what I've been seeing in the last years, while talking to these leaders in government, is that now you have these new, very strong leaders in governments that are really there to be able to transform what is happening with governments. The second thing that is happening is that, again, we're being able to engage a community that before was never engaged with government. Uh, we've been able to see hackathons in Costa Rica, in Peru, in Chile, in the US, where you're mixing citizens, developers, journalists, with people from government that are explaining some of the problems they have, some of the things that they would like to solve, and then together they're working to, to be able to solve those problems. Now, case study, city of Palo Alto. This is a case where Jonathan Rakentel, this guy up there, became CIO 2012. He basically said, we are going to transform government and make it become a platform. Government as a platform was his theme. He said, open data is going to be relevant to make this happen. And basically, the main reasons behind that were, we want to pull a lot of innovation from citizens. We want to be able to push the limits and give an example of what can be done once you open data. And then we want to bring civic engagement to a complete new level. Basically, what we did with them was, and, and now think about open data, right? Government has a lot of information, data sets. These data sets are great for academics that want to do a lot of statistics uh, and analysis. But it's not that easy to digest if you're just a citizen that wants to learn what's going on with your budget, what's going on with some other things that are going on in your city. So what we do with uh, these technologies is bring a lot of these data sets that today are hidden in systems or in databases, transform those data sets into understandable data, usable data, and then allow for people to do things with that. In this case, this is an example of how the, the open data sites look. And then the idea is, once this data is transformed, converted into usable data, then this data now can be shared and can be used in very different ways, from just exporting this data to then being able to insert this live data provided by a government into your spreadsheets or whatever you need to do. And a very interesting thing, as I mentioned before, be able to have an API that allows you as a developer, as, uh, as a company, to connect to this data and then create applications, create mobile applications, web applications that can then be used by citizens. In this case, this example here, the one that we have here down in the left, in the right, is a case of an Irish company that grabs a lot of permits data from governments and transforms that into something that is being used today by developers, by real estate developers in Palo Alto, and by other people that want to know what's going on, what is being built around where they live. Uh, the other thing that is important when uh, was very important in the case of Palo Alto I, and is very important in general is it's not about just building these open data sites, then governments are promoting a lot of what they're doing. Similar to what Telefonica is doing with its data ton, uh, governments are really promoting what's going on. In this case, city of Palo Alto got a lot of PR out of doing this open data initiative. Uh, and very interesting, and this is how people have fun in San Francisco, right? But a, a bunch of 80 gigs meet in San Francisco to use this data provided by City of Palo Alto to use Cascalog to generate new applications. Again, how people have fun on Friday nights in San Francisco or Silicon Valley is an interesting story. Now, uh, another interesting case, and this is something that happened a lot when we were talking about open data and what Palo Alto was doing and Cupertino and City of San Jose in California, a lot of people came to us and said, well, that is Silicon Valley, of course. Silicon Valley is early adopters. They're doing open data. They're doing all this innovation based on open data. Uh, so we went south. We went to Costa Rica. Costa Rica is very well known by being a beautiful country. That's where my wife is from. We were telling that story before. Uh, so beautiful things, uh, a beautiful wife I have in Costa Rica. And the, the thing that you know very well is that Costa Rica is not a very high-tech country, if you want. Now, we spoke with this digital government uh, director there that manages uh, a lot of applications being done there. And basically, 
she de decided they wanted to do open data because of transparency reasons to change the status quo and to be able to engage again with citizens at a very different level. They also created a home where they described the reasons behind opening data. They were able to, and this is a very interesting case, they were able to gather a lot of data from different ministries, different cities, different institutions in Costa Rica, each of those with an open data site and then all centralized into one main uh, open data site. And again, in the case of Costa Rica, they've already done a couple of hackathons. Uh, again, a lot of developers using this data. One good example of what was developed is Costa Rica is a very uh, a country that has a lot of earthquakes. So some of the teams gathered a lot of data about earthquakes and created a lot of very interesting applications around that. So what we've seen also in these cases with governments, with cities, is that usually there is a theme, either in the country or in the city. It could be improving education, it could be safety, it could be other things. And then once they open data related to those themes, then you have a lot of people that come and be, are able to think about those themes and very creatively define new ways of solving problems. Uh, we went further south. We went to Bahia Blanca. Uh, I'm originally from Argentina. Uh, Argentina is a beautiful country. Uh, not the king of uh, transparency in some aspects, but a beautiful country. Uh, Bahia Blanca is a very, very interesting case of a turnaround. We usually hear about turnarounds in the private sector. Well, Bahia Blanca uh, took out the, the prior uh, mayor, if you want, for corruption issues. A new mayor came around. This mayor hired a new CIO with the clear decision that they wanted to change the status quo. They wanted to change the city to become a very innovative city. And again, they wanted to engage citizens at a very different level. And again, they created this platform. They even published a lot of salaries information. That was a whole interesting situation there in Bahia Blanca. But again, what you see is these leaders that are now coming on board in government. And because of how they're doing things and what they're doing, they're able to attract uh, a lot of development to happen. Uh, this is the data that I was mentioning, the salaries data that they were able to publish. And again, they were able to create this uh, API program, a lot of development. In the case of Bahia Blanca, they are a petrochemical uh, pole, so they have a lot of petrochemical uh, companies. They are sensing a lot of data about uh, climate and about um, uh, the air and how the air pollution. And they're bringing all this data live in the open data site that is now powering a lot of interesting applications that are being developed. So some lessons learned out of working with different governments, both in the develop, uh, development, uh, developing world and the developed world. The first thing uh, is that the, the governments that are getting into open data have to think about three different phases for these open data programs. One, where they experiment, they think about some data sets that may make sense for crowds like you. Why do you care about this data? Uh, and then think about interesting data sets that may make sense. Once they test that for three, six, nine months, then they're able to define how to make this operational, right? How to bring always the latest values of this data to be published so that this can power the third phase, which is innovation. Once you define the data sets, you test it, you make that operational. Now you have these live data sets that can power a lot of innovation that is happening in the cities. Second lesson, uh, and again, when I came out of university, I was always thinking, I don't want to touch government uh, I want to work far from government. That was my initial thinking. Once I started engaging with these new leaders, then you start seeing what they're trying to do and how they're trying to change and improve the lives that we have. But in, in the case of open data, there's a lot of uh, resistance in a lot of governments. So it is crucial to have someone at the leadership level, either a city manager, a mayor, someone strong in the local government that can really push for these things to happen or this doesn't move. Third thing, beyond the platform, by the way, Juno is one platform, there are others. 
beyond just implementing an open data solution, the crucial thing is communicating this, being able to engage with citizens. We've seen a lot of cities that were able to deploy an open data program. They had the technology, they had the data sets. And if you're not able to communicate and bring different type of audiences to know what's going on, to know about these transparency initiatives, then again, this goes nowhere. Finally, and this is also something very interesting that is happening today, uh, how many of you know what is Agile or what is Lean, the Lean startup? Okay, nice. We have a good amount of geeks around. So before, if you thought about government implementing these kinds of things, this would have been six months to one year to two years implementation projects. The case of Palo Alto was something that happened in two weeks. The case of uh, Bahia Blanca happened in one month. What we're seeing today is that these governments are being able to implement, uh, to, to use the lean approach to be able to implement interesting projects in government. And they are able to quickly try things. If they're wrong, if they make a mistake, then they just correct and continue that feedback loop in such a way that they're really, really being able to become very agile. Now, to finish up and tell you a little bit about what I think is coming with open data, uh, we, we come from a situation where we had a lot of valuable data. When I was asking before, how would you go and publish some of this data? You didn't know, but probably all of us here have, starting with personal data that we may not want to do, we have researchers that do a lot of research, naming one here, with a lot of valuable data. We have a lot of, of course, government data. We have a lot of corporations that have a lot of valuable data. The case of Telefonica, using a lot of this valuable data to then generate new value with that. So data is out there, but it's hidden somehow. And by the way, then you have some monopolies, some, uh, or some companies such as Bloomberg or Capital IQ that are able to process a lot of open data to then transform it into something valuable to then sell this valuable data. Now, we're coming from there. And we're going or we're moving at different speeds in different places to a data economy, right? The first wave of change in this open data ecosystem, if you want, is this dream by compliance. The government sector has the mandate to open data. That is really being very powerful uh, and powering a lot of transparency. And that has been the initial movement that has taking a lot of governments to make the, the first step into this. The second wave is, now that we have all this open data, what do we do with it? And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of innovation that is going on ar around this open data. This data is allowing governments to collaborate. Someone was telling me a couple days ago, there are some cases where different units in a local government, in a local government instead of sharing data within themselves, if once, uh, one group wanted data, they would go and do a public request to get that data to then be able to use that data. Instead of just going department to department, they were doing that. Of course, that is not efficient, right? And open data is allowing for this competitiveness and these collaboration levels to, to really happen. There's a third wave that is I would say it's probably two years uh, to really, really uh, materialize. And that is transforming this valuable data into money. And though open data is all about open and all about transparency, there have to be business models behind this open data to make this sustainable in the long term, right? And there are already some interesting cases of people that is grabbing some of this open data and transforming that into uh, money, which, again, helps this positive cycle to keep nurturing. Uh, the idea at the end of, the, of, of this path is to be able to have a lot of data that is being used, a lot of data that is being published very quickly, a lot of processes that allow this data that is being published to then be used by a lot of innovative people, and to transform the web into something uh, much, much more useful than what the web is today. If you think, uh, or I, li I like dif dividing the web into what we call the, the content web 
and the data web. And probably there's an entertainment web and some others. The content web, we have been using that for a good amount of years. There's a lot of content in the web. There's a lot of search engines or people that allow you to find the content that you want in the web. There's a lot of tools that allow you to publish cool stuff in the web. And then you can use, you can do RSS feeds, you can do a lot of things with the content in the web. The data web has not been there. Uh, again, we were not able to publish data, we were not able to find data. And this is, for me, the next very interesting revolution in the web. All what, I, what the content web provided you was, if you want some level of research, entertainment, finding content, now we're getting into a phase where the web is going to be able to power a lot of very, very valuable applications that we will use in our day to day. And I don't want to get into the detail on that, but basically, in the case of government, uh, we have the, the idea of they're pushing a lot of data out for some reasons. Uh, they're getting value by engaging. They're getting value by the innovation that they're being able to generate, by the efficiencies that they're creating as well, and by the better decision making that now federal government and local government is being able to make. And I spoke a lot about government, but I only want to leave you with the idea of companies and organizations will have a lot of reasons to open some of the data they have, to keep their stakeholders happy, to generate better products and services, to be able to generate new revenue lines with this valuable data, and to be able to get innovation coming from outside. And there are some interesting examples of banks that are doing that today. They're opening some valuable data they have. They're giving that to certain groups of developers that, uh, are, uh, that comply with some of the rules on how to use this data. And they're generating app stores with their data that is then useful for their end users, right? And again, uh, BI and being able to make decisions. Same thing with academia, and I'm not going to get into all the detail here, but all these sectors, starting with governments, are coming into this open data uh, wave. And again, just to finish up with the nice image here, government is starting with this. It's going to evolve to a lot of other sectors. And in five, six, 10 years, we will have a lot of this valu valuable data powering a lot of applications that we'll be using in our day to day. With that, I'll thank you guys. And I'll open that to questions if you have. Questions? OK, thank you. So um, well, this afternoon, there was a speech over there uh, about smart cities. And yeah, they need to publish open data coming from sensors in the smart cities. So this is uh, also an interesting challenge for governments, in this case, for municipalities. Um, they mentioned three, three important challenges there. One about standards. Uh, Formats, protocols, what's there? I mean, is anything, you know, uh, more or less uh, adopted as a standard? They all also talked about real-time APIs, not only just to download mm -hmm. data, uh, but to receive data in real time and then process it. And finally, they also talked about the interoperability of data sources. So, yeah, coming from different uh, organizations, and even to build a kind of uh, you know, um, global market of data where applications can be easily monetized because you can sell the same application in different places and not only in the same in the same city. So I would like you to to elaborate a little bit. It's a complex question, but fantastic. Yeah. And by the way, you have like ten questions in that, but it's awesome. I know. And probably first thing, uh, there are companies like IBM, probably smart cities coming from IBM. There's SAP, SAP, that has uh, Urban Matters. There's uh, Microsoft and other uh, companies really working on this field because there's a lot to be done. And yeah, they come up with different names. But the idea of making cities smarter is, uh, goes uh, beyond all those companies, right? Second thing, I agree, all this data has to be uh, opened up in such a way that it's not only downloadable, but usable via APIs. And that, I think, we're all clear, and that is kind of solved. Most of the cities already, when they open data, 
they know how to create an API for that. Either they use solutions like ours that are packaged, or creating an API is not complete. I mean, not that complicated. The third thing is what you mentioned about the standards, and that's very interesting and very crucial. We're in the early days of open data. UK opens um, permits data in one way. The US or a city in the US opens that data in a different way. Uh, and in Argentina, they probably either uh, open that in a different way or they don't, they don't open that. So yes, it is true that there are no standards on how to open up certain types of data sets. We're even being asked by some of these cities, some of our clients, if I have this type of data, what's the best way of opening that up? What's the best way of uh, making that data of high quality? And it's true, there are no standards yet. We are helping some of these cities to define those standards uh, because we already know some companies that can use some of that data to then uh, provide some value. But this is in the very early days, and there are no standards on how to publish those data sets. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Very simply, you talk around the enrichment of data to be able to, f to sell on. The what, sorry? You talk about the data to be able to sell on. Um, I don't see where government data can, no, it's just out there. Where, where's, the, where, where's, the, where's the dollars in it? Good question. And uh, you know, there are some cities that, of course, when you say, hey, you can monetize this data, no, 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 no way. This is open data. You don't even want to think about how to monetize that. There are some other th cities that are thinking about that, mainly because they have a lot of costs in order to really open up quality data, right? So more than just revenue, sometimes it's being able to cover some costs. But your question is how to monetize this data. Uh, we have to be very clear that when we think about government data, there has to be a layer that is free for everybody, right? If you're a citizen, if you're a journalist, if you are a, a researcher, you should be able to go, if you're a developer, you should be able to go and grab some of that data for free. You're paying taxes already, that data belongs to you somehow. But then there's this idea of having higher quality data or curated data or value-added data, right? You may get all the data set of all the permits in London, right? But someone in government that can explain you why this is relevant versus that that is not that relevant, that has a value added that can be sold. So special reports that gather different data that do benchmarks and then give you something that is more polished than just a raw data set has a cost and it should have a price. And that has been monetized for a while. Then the second way in which we're seeing interest in monetizing, and by the way, this has happened for a long time. Uh, by the way, data has been one of the industries that has been mostly monetized in the web. Again, Bloomberg, Capital IQ, they grab open data, they curate it, they package that, and they sell that very expensively. So for governments to be able to sell some data that is being called via the API 1,000 times a, a day or a month or whatever the frequency becomes is something that makes sense. Why? Because a citizen will just go and grab some data. But if you're a company and you're calling this data via the API all the time, now that you're, we can measure that amount of API calls, now you know that there's somebody that is really making a business out of using this data. And then if they're making money, it makes sense for the government to at least recover some costs. Does that answer yeah. your question? So at first, uh, sorry my English, but uh, I have a question. What do you think about uh, the using this data in the real world? I think we have uh, many great researchers like behavioral economist Dan Ariely, Hans Rosling and many others, which have um, amazing results of, those, uh, of the research. But they have a big problem to use uh, this data and these results okay. if in, 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 in real world, in practice. What do you think about uh, this problem? Oh, I... So, if... Uh, we came two years ago. If this was happening two years ago and we are having this conversation, I would have said yes. Big trouble. Difficult to find data. By the way, I didn't mention here, but when you go to government sites, usually you can go to a transparency area and usually there's a bunch of very super valuable data 
in PDF format. And PDF, you cannot do anything. And sometimes it's even worse. It's not just a, a, a Word document that was transformed into a PDF. It's just a scan of a document that can never be used by any human being, right? So uh, two years ago, with all these PDFs, I would have said yes. Try to spend your time with something else. Today, at least you can go to some of these governments that are already opening data. They have APIs. You can call the data, and you can use that data. Uh, Hans Rosling would probably be able to go and grab some of the data from all the cities that we're working with, get the APIs, inject that into his visualization engine, and then tell his great stories with live data that is being generated by these cities. And that is now. In a few years, if you want to create visualizations, if you want to create an application, you're going to be able to go to some places, and there are some other players that are going to appear in this industry, find, I don't know, census data or utilities data or whatever data from North America, and you're going to have a lot of feeds, API feeds that will allow you to get all that data into your visualization or whatever. So I think this is only getting better. Uh, the question that was asked before about the standards, today, if you go to all these cities, you probably will get all this data, but in different formats, not formats, in different structure, if you want. In a few years, there's going to be standards on how to open some type of data. There's going to be some standards on how the APIs should work. And then you're going to be able to grab all this data, and it's going to be less of a problem than it is today. Does that answer your question? Yes, but uh, I have another question. Um, we have a results, not the IT problems with the format. That's not the question. But we have uh, results, the very surprising results. For example, how we weave a poverty, how we weave a poverty lens. But we have a big problem to uh, force the government to change the books uh, from which we learn the kids. We have, um, do you know, Dan Ariely and uh, his researchers from MIT and Duke and so on. There are lots of very surprising data how, how to make uh, business more effective, how to force people uh, don't uh, uh, not steal so many things and how they, um, uh, how they think about the money. But we have, we have a big problem to use that it, in, in real because the people don't want to uh, make a change. They are very lazy, I think. What do you say about this? I think the problem is not that we don't have the data. I think the problem is that we are very lazy to use this data and change the business. Yeah. Look, I, I agree. I think that uh, smart people like you or others that are trying to use data have the problem that you're probably spending 70% of your time first finding the data and then curating some of the data that, again, may be in different formats, different ways, different ways of reach, uh, reaching the data. So you're spending a lot of your valuable time in just those pieces that are not highly value added, right? And then only 30% of your time, and this is research that we did with analysts that were grabbing a lot of data to do other things. Only 30% of their time was really dedicated to, once I have all this data, how can I use that data? What can I, what can I create? How can I tell a story with that data? So I completely agree with you. Today, yeah, you go to a lot of sources. These sources are despair. You need to spend a lot of valuable time to just to accommodate the data. The only thing I can answer there is it's getting better. We're trying to, to make it better, but it's, it's going to take some years to ensure that. By the way, organizations like the Gates Foundation, right? Uh, the Heron Foundation, a lot of other foundations in the world, the Case Foundation. Uh, I've been in an event a uh, couple months ago, and they are thinking about hey, we're giving grants to all these people, these NGOs. These NGOs then go to Africa and they get a lot of research, they analyze, they learn a lot of stuff. And then a lot of that data ends up in a beautiful PDF or in an Excel file that nobody knows where it is. So they are, it's not only governments, NGOs that are funding these initiatives are thinking, how do we spend some of the money that we give to these guys in such a way that once they finish, we have an open data feed of all the valuable lessons learned and all the data that they have discovered through the research. So again, not an answer for now. You're going to be unhappy for a couple more years, but hopefully we're going to help you improve this stuff. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah? 
It's not a question, it's just because we've been talking a lot, but I just wanted to add on that. Um, I'm quite surprised that you're quite pessimistic about this, and I would just hope that you're you know, changing your mind. Actually, what I'm seeing is lots of people getting engaged as in, you know, in open source and this peer, I mean, production that you see in open data really develop, delivering actual benefits. You see lots of cases in health, for example, um, using data from the NHS that you could, I mean, really map which drugs were more effective or not, and you actually save, you know, the government lots of money. And that was an exercise done by people working voluntarily. I've seen many examples of this in Kenya. You see other examples. I mean, it's not just happening, you know, in the developed world. And I would say, for me, it's really amazing to see how these people are exactly the opposite of what you are saying, you know, being lazy to change things. It's actually, I want to see how my government is spending, and you will find this, you know, the open spending project of the Open Knowledge Foundation. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, wandering around and find lots of good causes to collaborate. So more optimism. <laughs> and perhaps one quick comment to that, which is very true, I completely agree. When I was your age, I decided not to even touch government because I wouldn't even have the chance to sit in a place like this where we're talking about open data. Today, at least we're talking about that. There are some people that are doing that. There's some interesting peer pressure. Uh, we have the case on, in California where there are five or six cities that are opening data. When you go to another city, they say, wow, these guys are opening data already, I should do something, right? So I think that just the fact that you're here being able to ask that question and being able to grab some of the data is, a, is much better than what it was 20 years ago. I'm assuming that you're in the, your 20s and I'm 40, so. Any other question or I think... Yeah. I don't think so. Hey, thank you all. Thank you very much, Diego. And thank you all. Our next session will start here at 9 o'clock, which will be delivered by Rob Brown and called Digital Communications Are Dead. You're all very welcome to join for that.